And coming up on today's Green Signals, your railway podcast. Behind the scenes at Hitachi Rail's Newton Aycliffe train building works. Avanti West Coast's new Evero train fleet launches, or is it Evero? Will Richard get into some hot water with Richard Branson? And the Leavenmouth Railway branch officially opens north of the border in Scotland. But we begin this week's Green Signals with a really special feature. At the invitation of Jim Bruin, Chief Director of Hitachi Rail UK and Ireland, Richard and Steph spent some time looking behind the scenes at Hitachi's Newton Aycliffe works. Now, many Green Signalers listen to us via audio podcast, and indeed, some who subscribe to us via YouTube and our Green Signals channel listen to it on audio in the background. That's great, because our special feature on Hitachi works really well on audio. However, Richard and Steph produced some fantastic video at the works, so if you haven't already, head over to our Green Signals channel on YouTube, remember to subscribe, and then watch this remarkable film. This is British Rail's high-speed train, commonly known as the Intercity 125. Designed by British Rail engineers in Derby and styled by Sir Kenneth Grange, Introduced in 1976, it was a ubiquitous site on Britain's railway for over 45 years. And then, almost as quickly as it arrived, it departed, and for most faded quickly into a memory. In 2024, a few remain, but not for long. It's fair to say that Hitachi Rail's 8300 series of trains has become the new Intercity 125. Ordered in large numbers by LNER, Great Western Railway, East Midlands Railway, Avanti West Coast and open access operators such as Lumo and Hull Trains, it too has become a regular sight up and down the country. Hitachi has invested around £110 million since 2015 in a state-of-the-art factory in Newton Aycliffe, County Durham, to support the ongoing programme and provide employment and hope to the northeast of England, the very essence of levelling up in action. Yet indecision and funding issues have meant the orders have dried up, and less than 10 years after being opened, the Newton Aycliffe facility faces a genuine threat of closure, taking with it the hopes and dreams of the men and women who work there. Jim Bruin, Chief Director of Hitachi Rail, UK and Ireland, invited Green Signals to Newton Aycliffe to learn more, and it was Jim we spoke to first. Jim, um, I have to say, I've been in a fair few train manufacturing plants over the years. I've never seen a view quite like that. I mean, this is this scale is absolutely extraordinary. But this is still a relatively new facility. Before we talk about that, though, let's just go back even further. Yeah, Itashi Rail. Um, still a relative newcomer to the market. How, do, how did the story begin? Where, where, where oh, does wow. it start? Uh, a long time ago, I think 2005, 2004, right. maybe even earlier than that, thinking about it. But So the UK was identified by Japan um, you know, decades ago in terms of its ability for us um, to potentially come into, come into the market. So that was very early on in our thinking, etc. They looked at a number of markets around the world and opened a number of sales offices, the UK being one of them. Um, we were successful on Class 395, our first order, which was sort of bid um, from a temporary team out of London with support from Japan. And really that opened the floodgates for us because it was the, the train, javelin, javelin train for the 2012 Olympics. Hitachi got a lot of momentum from that yeah. sort of time period. Um, but since then, the Intercity Express project, we've won a number of series of order of rolling stock, which has just allowed us to grow within the UK from the idea that there's sort of a, a principal openness and an understanding and appreciation of Japanese technology within the UK market. I mean, you're, the, the, um, the 800 series trains, you know, the, the, the first IEPs, obviously, yeah. uh, and then all that have followed from that. I mean, you've, it's become quite ubiquitous now. I mean, you've become almost like the, the current 
high-speed train mm -hmm. um, in the UK. Presumably, as, as you've gone, you've learned and you've developed. Yeah. And my understanding, continuous improvement is a big part of what Absolutely you guys think and do. It, it, it is. You know, it, it, we're, we're not perfect, Richard, but the, the mentality, the idea around continuous improvement, that small incremental changes as we go from one fleet design, build, delivery to the next, is about making sure in the longer term we have this view of continuous performance to, a, to, to the point of excellence. Our fleets are very, very reliable. I think we're around two and a half times the national average in terms of reliability of the fleets that um, we, we've just referenced. So the performance is high and it's based on that learning, that lessons, that transfer of, of knowledge and skills, leaning on global expertise from Japan, very important. But I think our performance stands out in terms of reliability against that continuous improvement um, principles that is really dear to Itachi and, and more Japanese culture. But um, when you started the journey here um, and won the original IEP contract, yeah. This wasn't on the horizon, was it? So, no. so this came later. What, what led to that decision? Because you, presumably you could have just carried on following the IEP model with, yes. with other orders. Yeah, we could have. And the factory wasn't linked to in, uh, IEP. It was a decision made that this would become our European hub for potential export opportunities to drive a much more broader export, etc. At that, at that time. So the decision when we opened this factory, it, it obviously needs a stable and consistent um, domestic market to lever from, yeah. but it was designed for export on that into the wider EU at that particular moment in time. Uh, Brexit, Covid uh, have sort of slowed them that ability down to a certain extent. We're hoping one day that that may come back, but right now the domestic market is really what this place has um, in terms of order books into the into the near future. But one of the things that's great about what you've done, you've thought about the future, you've planned for the future, yeah. so. The rigs that are yeah. um, for, for assembly, we were seeing the, the grooves that actually allow you to move them apart and build to a European yeah. gauge, which is fantastic. That's right. So we designed in, I know you like this a lot, we, des <laughs> we designed in the staging effectively. Yeah. So we can actually pull the staging out that we're standing on to yeah. a European gauge, which allows us to build trains um, for the EU market very simply and easily because the foresight full fundamentally was we need to be able to adapt to different markets and build different kinds of rolling stock potentially from here. Yeah. One of the more recent investments by Hitachi in the Newton Aycliffe factory is the superb welding and painting facility. I spoke with Scott Ramsey, the production manager responsible, to learn what goes on in the facility and the skills required to work there. Well, I'm delighted to be joined here by Scott Ramsey. Yep. Uh, and your role in Hitachi is what, Scott? So I'm the production manager for Newton Aircliffe for the car body site, uh, and that includes welding activities and painting activities. And we, we're in the welding shed here. Yep. Um, so just walk us through the, the process. Uh, how, what, ha what starts at one end and what comes out the other? How long does that take? So this is a fairly new process for us. So in 2020, we evolved from an assembly site through to uh, car body manufacturing, which uh, evolved from uh, assembly operations through uh, welding manufacture and then painting operations. Those car bodies then move through this process and then they go to the assembly line, which is next door. So this is uh, around about three or four years old. Right. Uh, I was involved from the very, very start. So I was here uh, involved in the recruitment of new people and basically establishing this process. The process is, is quite, it's quite simple. We receive uh, between five and six panels from, uh, from our suppliers, and then it's my job to assemble those, weld those panels. And what you're looking at here is our weld line for the uh, Abellio East Midlands Rail project. There's 33 trains that we're doing, they each uh, have five cars, so a total of 165 car bodies that we're welding here from start to finish. How long would it take before a finished car body came out the other end? So we work, we operate a 24 hour shift pattern here, so okay. we, do, we do 12 hour shifts, and each car body takes 37 or 38, depending on what type of car it is, shifts to go from start through to finish. I mean, three, why, why the extra hour for? So in some cases we have a drive car or, a, ah. or, an, or an intermediate carriage, and there's some slight nuances that are different between the carriages. Uh, and there's one of the, uh, a car one and a car five out of the five car set take a day longer than the intermediate cars. Got it, okay. So um, it was interesting what you said, that it's relatively new in the context of the whole site here so the decision to uh, bring welding on site is is a relatively new one yeah where 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 did the folks come from where did the team come from to be able to do this did you have skills locally or or how did you sort source that so one of the biggest challenges we had was recruiting welders so yeah. in the northeast and outside of the northeast region welding is a is a is a, is a common skill 
aluminium welding is not so common. It's quite a, it's quite a difficult skill to, uh, to attain. Um, so what we did was when we recruited, we needed between 40 and 50 operators. So that included some welders, some platers, and some team member operators. The welders and the platers were the difficult, difficult skills to recruit. So what we did initially was we spoke to our assembly operation uh, where there was between two and 300 assembly team members. And we said to those guys, does anybody have any tangible experience with welding? Some of them had past lives that were welders. Some of them were, had come from a welding background. We said, okay, who's interested? What we'll do is we'll test you, we'll analyze, we'll assess that. Could you, you could your skills transfer to what we need? And 70% of the workforce right now have come from the assembly side. Oh, really? So, so it's so, literally, it's kind of homegrown, it's, literally. It's internal, yeah. it's internal training, and it's, uh, it's, we've upskilled all of our welders from, from, the, from, the, from the team member so side. How long well. does it take to, to become um, skilled to be able to do, deliver sort of aluminium welding to the standard that you require? So we looked at around about six months. We thought right. six months was a, was a, was a fair shot. Uh, in the initial stages, that included some assessments. What we found that was the best thing we could do is we sent our guys over to our sister plant in Italy and we gave them some on-the-job experience. Right. So in 2020, we had nothing to practice on. So the guys that said that they could weld, we had to, we had to test it out. We, had to, we also had to upskill them and train them. We did that by knowledge transfer with our Italian plant. So we sent the guys over, and I, and I was over there for months at a time, learning on the um, aluminium welding process that the Italians do, which is a very, very similar process to what we do. Right. So this is an a design, Italian design, so they've designed it. They support it with the initial manufacturing process and they also upskilled our welders. Then it was my role to internally train and recruit additional welders. Let's just talk briefly about paint, where obviously the, the paint booths are separate and we'll show some images of some absolutely extraordinary paintwork. I mean, I've got to say, I've seen a lot of painted rail vehicles. Yeah. I'm not sure I've ever seen one quite to the standard <laughs> of that. Happy. It's magnificent. Yeah. I mean, there must have been quite a big learning curve in that to get to be able to get to do that now, the way you are. So the learning curve for paint was an even steeper one. So we had two paint experienced people um, who joined the team. We have a team of 24 that started, and we had two that had experience. The rest of the other 20, uh, 24, so 22, came from volunteers who had hobby interest in painting from the assembly side, and they all went into the paint shop and we upskilled all those guys. That's brilliant. So we've upskilled, we've, we've, we've got additional painters now that have come from ex, uh, external, but 22 of the 24 original painters were team member assemblers the week beforehand. And the even bigger challenge with that was, when we had the opportunity to send our uh, welders to Italy to learn, to knowledge transfer, when we established this, it was 2020, year of COVID. All of our travel, all of our training plans were, um, were restricted because of, because of uh, local, local lockdowns. So all of our experience is internally trained. Ban on. That's magnificent. Well, look, I, I tell you what, the, the finished product um, is just is something to behold, I have to say. So right, clearly, clearly the training and the and the way that you know everybody's kind of working together is superb. So it's listen, congratulations on a fantastic product, and let's let's much. hope we get some of that certainty soon. Absolutely, Scott. Yeah. Thanks ever so much. You're welcome. Cheers. Thank you. The quality of training and development and skills creation at Newton Aycliff is just one aspect of what has been achieved that really stands out. Jim Bruin again. Let's just talk about the people. One of the things that having spent a bit of time uh, walking around and talking to folks yeah. is you, there's a real there's a real pride in the job yeah. um, we were looking at a, a, a vehicle that was al almost complete and lots of little post-it notes on it where you know the guys have gone no that just needs sorting and that needs sorting yeah. I, I couldn't see yeah. <laughs> right and I thought I was pretty yeah. picky <laughs> so clearly attention to details absolutely everything where where the other folks come from from here because this doesn't have a strong um the regional uh, sort of supply chain and workforce probably not really in the rail sector so where, where how did you we, build this workforce we, we're about, we, the factory opened in 2015 yeah and um, so it is a number of years since then but there was there was an absolute decision made around we're going to recruit for attitude we're going to recruit from adjacent industries from the military for example we're going to look to build in people who have the right hand skills but also we're going to recruit for, for attitude and the pride and passion is the northeast. Um, it, it is a hub that has railway history and heritage, etc. 
But I think two things really come out for me with the team here who are, who are incredible is their pride and their passion for everything mm. they do. And when you come to quality, this, this matters to them as individuals. So they want to make sure the quality is right. They will double check, triple check things. They have a pride in the job and it, and it really comes through in everything we do and trying to deliver for our client base once trains leave the facility. But, but having made the decision to build a factory, you didn't stop there. So we've, see, we've seen the welding um, uh, facility and had a chance yeah. to chat with Scott in there. You've obviously got a paint shop facility. I mean, I mean generally, I mean, if everybody wants to see how to hand paint a train, it's that. I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, these are these are high skilled things. Yeah. But yet, you thought, no, nope, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep yeah. developing. What what was the de decision that that caused that to to, uh, to come about? This transition of knowledge. Um, we've got a global footprint as well. We're a big big um, global organisation, and we need to make sure that we've got capabilities around the patch. We saw a deficiency in the UK market that no car bodies manufactured takes. We are the only car body manufacturer in the UK who does that level of welding. So we saw an opportunity to differentiate ourselves yeah. effectively. So decisions on weld and paint, um, it is highly um, skilled work, um, especially aluminium welding. We've taken a lot of um, the team from the, sh from the assembly um, side of the business. We've trained them over three years to be aluminium welders to the right level. And that transition's been upskilling our teams, levelling up if you like, is really important in terms of the mindset of what we're yeah. trying to do with the teams here. Uh, but welding and paint gave us a different, it gave us a different, it, it, yeah. made us, it made us have more competence, we do more manufacturing here than anybody else. Um, and that was fundamental to this decision that was made. So today, how many people working on this site? Roughly, with um, permanent and we've got some fixed term contract, we've got some contingent labour, we're about 900 people actually okay, in the facility right. at the moment. Yeah. And do you have an idea of the sort of size of local supply, local supply chain that you support in terms of employment off the back of this? Um, it, it's big in the local area, but yeah. in the UK it's around we, we, 960 suppliers is a number that we yeah. often use and, and have an anal analysed in terms of who supports this um, facility and our wider maintenance and operational yeah. business. So there's a huge UK supply base that actually supports what we do here. You know, everything from the catering teams um, it, all the way through to, to parts, special jigs, 3D printing. We use a lot of the local, um, lot of the local um, businesses around the, the, the site to support us in everything we do. A high performance culture is something that is hard to achieve. Only the best companies really do achieve it. It takes time. It requires continuous improvement and commitment, especially when you're starting with a blank canvas. I spoke with Craig Brown. Head of production. I mean, we've had a chance to see an awful lot um, in this facility, um, but you're responsible for all, all aspects of the production. We've looked at um, uh, welding and we've looked at paint separately, but of course, the whole process, and then particularly the assembly section, is, is another thing entirely, isn't it? T tell us a bit about how you go about doing assembly here, and again, how you've trained up people to, to be able to do it to the standard we see. Yeah, so with, with the assembly area, we started in 2015 and we went through a large recruitment of around 700 people at the time, built in the culture of Hitachi into them and we trained them how to build trains. And we spent nine years doing that and we've invested a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy into it. But more so, those guys have invested time into Hitachi as well. They've left permanent jobs to come here to learn skills that have never been known to them. And we've trained that and we simply can't afford to lose that not with nine years worth of experience. No, you can see that experience in the quality of, of the work. Do you find, as you're doing things like assembly, there's a real learning curve and tasks take a certain amount at the beginning, but you, you get better at them, both in terms of quality and time? Yes, and every time we build, every time we do a new build, we start off slow and we develop the team, we learn the team, and we teach them how to do things. Um, and then we ramp up the speed and we start hitting our targets that we need to to achieve the customer um, satisfaction both in quality and time. Um, but the main thing is with those people as well is every time we're doing that they're learning something new. Yeah. So our most low skilled person to us is highly skilled because it's not like going into another place where you might just learn how to press a button and operate a machine. 
everything we do is by uh, using hands. We don't have robots, we don't have uh, mechanics out to build the trains. It is literally people's hands. I mean, it's almost like, it's almost like artisan skill, levels of skill, isn't it? I mean, I know, I know that people might think, oh, that sounds a bit sort of old-fashioned, but it's not. We're, we're in a digital age, but still done with great, great skill. Yeah, so with the skill levels, every time we bring, it, bring a new product online, we teach people how to do it again because things might uh, differ slightly. And each train will be slightly different. It could be different in size, it could be different in shape. And the skill that we've learned over the nine years, those people know how to adjust and to basically craft the panels, the, whatever we are fitting to make sure that it's fitted to the correct quality standards. And that's a skill that people can only learn over time. Oh. You can't give people that just by bringing somebody in uh, as a new person within a couple of hours, within a couple of days. It takes months and years to learn that. And like I said earlier, the, the nine years we've currently invested, we've got our low skilled person highly skilled. Well, it's so obvious when you look around and, 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 and not just the finished product, but the way people are clearly taking care for it. So listen, Craig, Thank, thanks for um, showing us around the whole of the facility and it, it's, it's an absolutely superb um, uh, team and a superb uh, facility, so thank you very no, much. Thank you, been a pleasure, thanks. A high profile guest on the day we visited was the Right Honourable Justin Greening, former cabinet minister who, amongst other things, was Secretary of State for Transport. She now chairs the Purpose Coalition, a cross-party organisation helping businesses and organisations to share best practice and improve the role they can play in breaking down barriers to opportunity in the UK. I spoke with Justine about what Hitachi were delivering in the North East, why it is so important and why in the UK we seem to find it so hard to deliver meaningful change for the long term. I'm delighted to be joined by Justin Greening, uh, former cabinet minister, of course, and with, uh, for, for a while, Secretary of State for Transport, and now chair of the Purpose Coalition. I wonder if I can ask you, Justine, um, first of all, in your report that you co-authored with Itachi Rail last October, in your foreword, you, you said this, you said, particularly impressive is the rail industry's multiplier effect. For every pound invested in rail infrastructure, it generates two pound fifty in income throughout the wider economy. This demonstrates the sector's capacity to stimulate economic activity far beyond its direct contributions. I mean, they're powerful words. Everybody involved in the rail sector would agree. So why do we struggle, do you think, as a country to put that into action and invest where it matters? I think part of the problem is almost government feels sometimes very short-termist. We've yeah. had multiple elections literally in the last, what, four, five, six years. And so, that is the opposite, if you like, of what the rail industry needs to really do and be at its best. You can see with what Hitachi has achieved here in New Today, if I remember coming here when it was a field, we'd just done the deal with Hitachi to make this their, their new European rail centre. And actually, look at it now. And it has been that multiplier effect. It's brought in jobs, skilled jobs. It's helped deliver a talent pipeline that local colleges are part of. That's put more money into the economy. It's stimulated a supply chain. And most of all, actually, those opportunities have been open to a wide range of people and really pointed into communities that needed them. So this is literally levelling up, but it does take time and it takes long-term commitment. And I think, Richard, what's missing is almost what I would call patient politics. The ability to stick with a decision that's working through the rough and the smooth and to try and make sure that when you get to those downturns you don't allow them to tip over a strategy on levelling up that's been delivering now for Hitachi and for the North East and particularly for Newton Aycliffe now for a decade. And that's, I mean that decade point and the people point's key isn't it? 2015 uh, David Cameron who was then the Prime Minister opened this facility so next year we should be looking forward to the 10th anniversary and when you walk around here you talk to the people i mean the skills the the training the pride in the job and actually just the the optimism in a region which has not had some of the best of times really so why what's wrong with our strategy and policy at government do you think that means that next year instead of looking forward to that 10-year anniversary we're actually looking potentially at a, a very dicey future for this yeah and i think building on those points earlier about the fact that actually you've got to protect 
these gains that we've had on levelling up. And I can really relate to all of this because I grew up in Rotherham in South Yorkshire during the 1980s and I saw literally what happens when a skilled workforce suddenly doesn't have anywhere to apply those skills. And, and actually, I think what we need to realise is there's a concept that Japanese manufacturers use called Kaizen. It's about continuous improvement. Yep. And I think, again, you come back to that and I think what it tells us is that it's hard to build up these wins on levelling up with things like Hitachi and everything that's contributed here. But it's easy to take those steps back. But when you take the steps back, it's often disproportionately difficult to then catch up. So almost what policymakers need to be much more alert to, I think, is understanding that these are risk moments. Yeah. If you can just manage through that short-term challenge, you disproportionately open up long-term benefit. And that is, this is a perfect example of that, where it's not that we don't need this factory here for the long term. We do. We know we've got the rail investment coming. We know we need this capacity. It's literally just the timing of 24 months. We can't allow 24 months to disrupt what could be a footprint that lasts 24 years and beyond for people around here and for to hit Archie and for Britain. We need rail manufacturing yeah. in this country. This is one of the, the key places it's happening. And that's why it's worth protecting it. And I think it comes back to policymakers having a longer term time frame when they're thinking about things I think it's about having approaches to policy on that pipeline that isn't just about say um, control period X Y and Z into the future but actually is looking at specific lines and specific procurements and I think it's then for all of the industry getting much more of a cross-party agreement on what that procurement pipeline looks like so that you're protected from those ups and downs are necessarily going to happen in any democratic yeah. um, country like Britain. Well, it's impossible to come around here and not feel optimistic. So let's hope that those messages do reach the places they need to and the long, steady, continuous improvement strategy for investment can continue here because what they've done is amazing, isn't it? So it's just, fantastic. just ingredient. Thank you so much. Thanks, Richard. Despite the tremendous success of Hitachi Rail in the UK over the last 20 years, and the superb facilities on show at Newton Aycliffe. And despite the proactive R&D in new initiatives such as the battery electric high-speed train, a lack of orders is putting everything at risk. I spoke to Jim about the real concerns he and the team now face. He was diplomatic and professional, but equally appropriately direct. But there are clouds uh, on the horizon. It would be, it would be foolish not to, to, to talk about that. The rolling stock sector in the UK does tend to go through this yeah. trough and peak and trough and boom and bust, whatever you want to to, you, to talk about it. So today, where are you guys? Are you sort of on the edge of a cliff or are you sort of seeing the cliff coming? Um, we, we have enough work here now in terms of manufacturing until the uh, March end of March 2025. So it's a really serious situation, yep. which you know well, you have to be able to engage your own supply chain for continuous production. So yep. right now the order book is empty. We need to engage and get something in um, very quickly in order to keep continuous production and keep our skilled workforce on this site. So it's a critical time for everybody involved here. Um, you know, there's a lot of worried faces. Um, there's a lot of hope, there's a lot of passion that we can find a solution, we hope, with, with the engagement that we're working towards. But it is serious that there's no order book and it could see a huge amount of that investment in skills and capability that we put here. We could see that um, leaving um, this facility you know, around, around March time with early consultations happening in the next few months. OK, so that would be, that'd be pretty, pretty awful. It, it, well, it would be absolutely awful and we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. But talk about solutions inside. I mean, what are the solutions? That's virtually no time. I think it's a fairly well-known fact that there are, that are contracted for options yes. in some contracts. So is it, is it really simplistic to say, j government, just exercise those contracts? Uh, we'd be, yes, uh, we would like to think so. Um, there are options in um, contracts that we have that can be placed. Right. Um, and that's for around um, 290 cars on West Coast. So the trains that you can see uh, yeah. in the factory that we're building for West Coast, anti West Coast at the moment, there is an option in that contract which could be placed and extended. Um, we've been in negotiations for um, um, some time in respect of that. 
and, and you know, we have engaged, we've been open with, with, with what that position in and asked a question around this time last year actually, can we have an early decision on whether that's possible or not? Which is, a, which is an obvious question because we have to think of what planning we need to take into account if, it's, if the answer is no. We, we received an answer at the end of March that that won't be possible, um, that, that that option can't be moved forward. So now we're back to the back to the drawing board in terms of what options we can think of um, to, to, to fill the production gap between um, the end of this work period and HS2. Um, so there's around a two to three year gap that we can see in respect of the production now. And we're just looking at what the options are after the no decision on that particular opportunity, what we can potentially do next. Uh, but the time, uh, the time we have to do that is incredibly short. So we're working around the clock at the minute with our teams here uh, with the DFT and with other stakeholders to try and find ways and means that will bring work into the facility as quickly as we can um, to bridge that gap effectively. You're, you're an immensely um, diplomatic and seasoned stakeholder manager, um, but it must be frustrating. And uh, I know I would be, I would be frustrated. And there must, but there must be a point where you go, sorry guys, we've kind of run out of time. What, What's the minimum that you think you really need in terms of a decision to be able to, to really bridge that gap? Um, that, was, that was a while ago, honestly okay. speaking. Um, that was a while ago in respect of a decision, but we're looking at ways in which we can accommodate that it, it, it potentially, to see what the opportunities are. Right. So we need to look at these options, build in opportunities, and then see how we can mitigate, maybe as a short-term period, where we can do other things, and all of these options are being considered at the moment. And I don't, you know, you can't give things away, but are the things like potential maintenance opportunities here, I wonder, possibly, is there any refurb that you might be able yeah. to do? I mean, presumably that's, when you say looking at options, it's all of the above, is it? I, I think for us, critically, we've invested a lot in the skills base, as we yeah. just described. We put a lot of effort in terms of upskilling and getting the people here to a level of excellence and world-class manufacturing capability. We'd be, we'd be loathe to lose that. We don't want to lose any of our permanent skilled resource if we can help it. We don't want to do that. So yes, there are other opportunities, but then other opportunities potentially mean there will be some headcount that would leave here. And what we're trying to do is find ways that that wouldn't happen. We will work as hard as we can to do that, yeah. but it may get to a point you know, in the next few months where we have to talk to the, uh, as, a, as a, a respectable employer, we have to look after these, our team members. So if we need to have consultation discussions, we'll have to do that in the short term in order to make sure we can either help them get find a new, new employment ourselves and work through that, but also give them the longest chance they can in terms of completing work here and then moving straight into employment elsewhere. Yeah. So the decision is about how responsible we are as a business now in respect of the short period we've got to find time to bring new options in to, to build here. So we're trying to balance these things at the moment. Yeah, I completely understand that. I mean, there's a there's a great plaque in the um, in the entrance when you the reception when you arrive um, when this facility was opened in 2015 by the then Prime Minister David Cameron. Yep. Um, you've got your 10 year anniversary coming up next year. Mm. Wouldn't it be absolutely brilliant? You know, for everybody here, but for the region as a whole. Which, let's face it, not had the best of times in terms of manufacturing industrial strategy. If mm. that 10 year anniversary could be celebrated with a, a clear you know, a clear plan for the future. It would be, it would be fantastic. It's yeah. also the 200 year anniversary of the railway um, next year. Absolutely. So, um, you know, we, we want to celebrate yeah. that and be part of it on the basis that we're a sustainable business, a credible business for the long term future and a supporter for the UK rail industry on technology skills and rolling stock. So we're looking at them two anniversaries and thinking we really want to be there and be part of it. Um, we need to work incredibly hard now with all of our stakeholders to find the answers that we need. And that's what we're trying to do. Well, what a brilliant, optimistic um, point to end on. I've got to say, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to see it. It's blow, blown my mind, really. Um, the scale, the quality, the, the passion, the people. It was absolutely su superb. So thank you, Jim. Thank you to all your uh, colleagues who've made us so welcome. And listen, we're, we're rooting for you. And I'm, I'm, I'm confident that the right thing will be done. I'm, I'm sure you, you hope you. so, too. Yeah, fingers crossed. Thanks ever so much, Richard. Pleasure. Well, that's been a really superb uh, day and experience. I'd not been to Hitachi Rail in Newton Aycliffe before. I've been to plenty of other uh, rail manufacturing sites around the world, never this one. But I have to say it has really blown me away. Not just the facilities and the investment, the technology, but as we talk about in that film, the people, um, the skills, 
the training, um, where they've come from, the, the attitude, the pride in the job, and the optimism, but also the concern about the future. Uh, I think they have reasons to be optimistic. The, the, the innovation, the focus on continuous improvement, you know, these are world leading um, strategies and that battery electric uh, train that we had a chance to see is really just kind of next level stuff really. And I think could be a real uh, game changer, um, not just saving money for train operations, but obviously saving money for infrastructure. But they need a decision uh, on uh, new orders to sustain them through the um, next few years. I don't think there's any doubt that these guys at Itachi are absolutely committed and they've got a clear vision and they are so committed to this region, um, but they do need support. And then we absolutely need to look at the long term. How do we get out of this cycle of boom and bust, but instead think about frameworks and long term continuous improvement and development strategies that don't just help the supply chain around here in the northeast, but help, help the whole country as well. So I've had an absolutely terrific um, uh, visit. Hope you've enjoyed that. And um, that's all from Green Signals for now. We hope you enjoyed that fantastic video from Hitachi Newton Aycliffe with some really creative touches by Richard and Steph in the shooting and the editing of that. Really good to see. Anyway, I'm Nigel Harris here in brightening lincolnshire accompanied by as usual well, richard bowker uh, here in wiltshire where it's a bit gray can i just say i'm sure i speak on behalf of the entire nation when i say <laughs> could the weather decide whether it's summer or not summer right the bit i can't bear is one week it, one day it's summer and the next day it's just not so it's absolutely right i mean i actually had the heating on the other day which is ludicrous at this time of year. no we haven't quite gone that far but then yeah but that's the joy of living a bit further south actually but either, well, you... <laughs> either either way please make your mind up and stick to it That'd be well good. of course you are slightly nearer the equator and conversely i'm <laughs> I'm near the Arctic Circle. So that makes yes. perfect sense, Richard. Absolutely. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you think of the uh, of the trip around Hitachi Rail then? I thought it was really good. Um, I remember the factory opening in 2015. Funnily enough, it opened the same week as the Borders Railway uh, because I remember travelling to Scotland from Newton Aycliffe for, um, for the press event opening the Borders Railway, which just before the Queen opened it. And what struck me even then was what struck you and Steph there was the the absolute power of the commitment from the people. Um, Hitachi did an extraordinary job of recruiting um, from across the industry and certainly from across the region when they opened it. And it, it, it's really borne fruit. Um, it's hard to describe, isn't it? but there's a real sense of that sort of railway community, let's get this done. We're all in it together and we're going to do a damn good job while we do it, which we want to see all over the railway, which often, which you usually do, to be honest. Yeah, and that word community, I think, is was our big takeaway, really. Uh, it was... It was quite a it was quite a humbling experience, and I don't normally you know sort of say that when you're a little bit old and cynical sometimes these days, and I, I didn't feel that when I was there. You, from the moment you walked in, you felt a sense of family and community and engagement. Uplifting, isn't it? Yeah. Well, not just with their own um, colleagues in the workforce, but also with their, obviously, the supply chain and the region that they, they're, they're, they're part of. And that was really, really good. And, uh, you know, Justin Greening, who was also there um, that day, um, former Secretary of State for Transport, um, who now chairs a something called the Purpose Coalition, which is excellent, by the way. We'll put a link to that on our website. People should have a look at what, what they're doing because that was really exciting as well, very inspiring. Um, even she sort of, you know, she pointed out it's, it's about the people, it's about the engagement, it's genuine levelling up um, in practice. So it was a great visit, really enjoyed it. And uh, got to say, by the way, big shout out to to Jim Bruin, who invited us, but also to everybody there. Nick Hughes, a sales director I've known for forever, um, for, to Andy Barr, who we used to work together at the Strategic Rail Authority. He's now at uh, Hitachi. Uh, to Doug, <laughs> the, the comms guy who's the even bigger worrier than I am. But Railway family brilliant. writ large. It was really, it, it, everything about it was, was, was terrific. So I really enjoyed it.
You mentioned Justine there, which um, she said something which leapt out of the audio soundtrack at me um, when you were talking about, you know, it would be a scandal to lose the factory and all the rest of it. And she said, what we need is patient politics. That was a good line, that wasn't oh, it? I, I like thought, that. Yeah. You know, because the, the name Rishi Sunak and HS2 immediately sprang into my mind, where politicians seem congenitally incapable of doing some strategic thinking and then coming up with a tactical plan which lasts more than five minutes and stick to it. Do you know um, what was interesting about that opening? Because you you had you were there, obviously, and you uh, let me have a couple of images from it that, that day. At the opening was, this is less than 10 years ago, David Cameron, George Osborne, Patrick now, Lord McLaughlin, Claire Perry. I mean, literally everybody turned up to that. You know, it was quite extraordinary and and yet here we are 10 minutes late uh, 10 years later sorry it feels like 10 minutes right in in terms of long-term rail investment and the same government and we're we're actually talking about the possibility of it of it being under serious threat i thought that patient politics line was was terrific and, and she's and, spot on and if you put their job titles it conveys the power of it so we have the prime minister the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Transport Secretary, the Rail Minister. And in Incredible. fact, the only reason George Osborne made a bit of a joke of it, he went on um, to, 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 to launch the proceedings, the opening, and he said, look, he said, I'm the Chancellor, and normally I'd be cutting ribbons and things. He said, but actually, I'm only here today to introduce my boss. <laughs> just the warm-up guy. <laughs> well, he was. But yeah, that, that yeah. was a full side turnout, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, and as yeah. you say, the pictures make it. But um, yeah. lessons there for today's politicians. Indeed so. And... Um, one good, yeah, uh, even more news from Hitachi. When when we were there, when Steph and I were there, uh, they were so open. They were very transparent. They showed us everything. Um, the one thing we weren't allowed to film, uh, and they weren't funny. They they were just, you know, it's because they're customer. Well, it's asked, customer confidentiality, customer isn't it? Customer confidentiality. We couldn't film the inside of the Avanti West Coast trains. Um, but, uh, and that's because they hadn't officially launched them, which, of course, they did. Uh, on Sunday, the second of June, so just just after we've um, just before we recorded this, um, they're named. Well, we're, we're, what are they named, Richard? Well, they, it, I think it's Evero, or it might be Evero. Anyway, or Evero. It, I suppose that's possible. Sorry, Avanti, we're not we're not poking fun. Honestly, we're not sure. So no, please, please let us know, and we'll make sure we correct that if we've got that wrong. I think the interesting point is, Richard, they've issued a little video in which we've just watched it, and that doesn't. Make it clear either. No, so. it doesn't. But 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 look, I mean, they are brilliant trains. I mean, they're all part of Hitachi's eighty three hundred series of trains, which have become quite well known around the network. Ubiquitous now, is the word you use. Ubiquitous. In the... um, these are going to serve North Wales, Northwest North Wales, and Birmingham um, routes. It's a twenty three uh, strong fleet of trains, ten seven carriage electric units. They're called Class 807, for those who um, are interested in that stuff. 13 five-car bi-modes, a bit like um, Great Western and, and, um, and LNER have got. Uh, they're Class 805. Um, they'll serve routes from London to the Midlands, Chester, North Wales, and then North West. In fact, if you're watching on YouTube, you've probably seen the bit of footage we're showing of some drone shots of, of one of them on the North Wales coast, which looks absolutely spectacular. Um, what, really interesting, the, eight, the Class 805, which is the five-car set, is replacing the Voyagers on these routes. Um, it has 299 seats, which is 16% more than the Voyagers it's replacing, which is great. And if you think that means they've packed them in like sardines... I was just about to ask. Yeah. Well, uh, the thing that blew us all away, um, uh, Steph tried them, I tried them, uh, Justine <laughs> Greening tried them. We all sat down on the seats in standard class on these um, Avanti West Coast trains. And I have to say, chapeau, they are absolutely brilliant. They were so comfortable. They just feel completely different. And that was really good. Um, so, no, look, it's really exciting. Um, it's, it's an investment worth £350 million. They'll be maintained at Alstom's Oxley Depot, which is near Wolverhampton. They'll work alongside the Pendolinos, which I think have pretty much finished their 100 and whatever it was, 1520 million pound refurb. And, and uh, that's a really kind of um, back to basic sort of refurb of those. So actually, you know, in uh, credit where it's due, really positive, great train, looks fantastic. Um, seats are marvellous. Well done, everybody. And I was delighted to see that there's such a bunch of seven cars. I mean, this five-car obsession drives me crazy. 
Um, and because I don't know whether you noticed or not, but the, the shot of the Azuma that close your package that I shot at Essendon is two five car sets together. Yeah, yeah. It's a pain for the passengers. It's a pain for the for the crews. And I just don't know why they do it. Well, I do, but yeah, yeah. No, no. I look uh, all all agree with all of that really. And I think uh, uh, one of the issues around open access, for instance, which we're going to talk a bit about later, is. Uh, a five car train takes up the same path as a as a nine, nine car. car train right so uh if you're looking at um efficient use of limited capacity then longer trains are better no no question about it and that was particularly noticed wasn't it when um the cross country hsts were re- nine cars or whatever were replaced by voyagers and I was... yeah it or 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 not actually replaced <laughs> Well, anyway, yeah. there's a, there's a, there's a, yeah, that's a, that's a whole different story, isn't it? Now, look, I think longer trains, I think as we, as we get better and smarter at capacity management, we've got to look back at that again. Uh, agreed. But I'm going to use your reference to open access, Richard. Oh. To, <laughs> ah, you can see it coming, can't you? To neatly segue into asking you an important question. Right. Is it possible you've really hacked off and i nearly didn't say hacked off then is it possible you've really hacked off somebody this week who may or may not have a beard uh, well i'm presuming you're referring to uh the uh comments that were quoted in the daily telegraph in the I last am. few days yeah about virgin's open access and therefore um richard branson uh yeah look it's more than possible um I would say in my defense, I'm not sure this is a defense that I probably hacked quite a lot of people off in the last few weeks, and I probably will <laughs> quite a lot in the next, uh, in the coming ones. But this was particular um, about Virgin's open access. Uh, but, and I suppose because I'm, you know, I'm an ex Virgin, that was a bit of an angle for them, wasn't it? So, oh, it think, certainly was. They, they the couldn't journalist... resist billing you as a no, former chairman no. of Virgin. No, but if you read my quotes, then my quotes are. <laughs> very well they, they are utterly consistent with what i said on the program a few weeks ago and and it's this you know i am i'm very clear about this i've never i never will actually criticize um or question an individual open access operator nope. i've been on i've been on them i think they're great i think they do you know some are better than others maybe but then that's true of everything really but this is not about nope. individual operators this is about open access per se. And the issue is, just for those who are, are not up to speed on this, when pre-COVID, let's call it pre-COVID, so post-privatization, pre-COVID, no sort of 20-year period, if you, if you had a franchise, uh, you knew there was a possibility that uh, somebody else could come along and bid for and possibly even succeed in getting open access slots, right? That was your risk. That's what you did. And and you bid your franchise subsidy or premium line accordingly. Uh, and if they did, if an open access operator was successful, you kind of just had to take the hit, right? So, and the gov, so the government didn't really mind because their their sort of subsidy stroke premium line was contracted and protected. Now, in truth, of course, when the franchise came up to be relet in the future, it, it kind of came home to roost there because at that point, of course everybody knew there was an open access operator now, but certainly for the, during the period of the franchise, revenue risks at the franchisee. Post COVID that has changed. Revenue risk now sits with the secretary of state. And actually, if you read um, an example of this, the grand union uh, operation to Sterling, the uh, ORR in its decision letter makes clear that one of the things is the impact on the funds available to the Secretary of State for Transport. It's very, very clear. Abstraction. So it is abstraction. Now, there's lots of re- there's, there are loads of other issues around performance and capacity and infrastructure costs, and of course, all the benefits of competition that open access bring. But my point was very much these days now, you cannot say there is no impact on the public purse um, because there is abstraction from a public sector operator. So the public, the, the taxpayer, in other words, you, me and Steph, are subsidising them. Um, and that's why it causes a lot of grief. So the, the, the bottom line, if I'm understanding it correctly, is we're running open access now against rules that were set up in the 1990s for a completely different world and they need rewriting. Uh, 
Well, I think they do need rewriting, but at the very what, what I said sort of publicly on on today and in the Telegraph was they need you you cannot just assume that everything about open access is great and it's going to shake things up no. and it's going to get it 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 might do those things but it will also have an abstraction and that has to be taken into account of in in deciding whether or not this is a good idea anymore but it's popular politically and it's popular with people isn't it and i think a big part of that is they are so sick of the well established and well-known problems of the existing operators it's seen as oh let, let's get them in again and but and particularly fix, on the west coast yeah. because oh virgin but, were really good let's get them back well of course it wouldn't be back at all would it um well the virgin were good they right? were, Look, I, 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 I was part of virgin so right i think i think what happened in the growth of that business and more services and the and the upgrade and the pendant Cool. I think that was brilliant, right? But it wouldn't um, be bringing that back. It's 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 a completely different operation. It's a different world, and uh, you don't fix the problems of current operators by necessarily bringing in a second one. You've you've you've, you've really that's not fixing the problem. Let's fix the problem. Fix right. the problem. Yeah. Not create another one that's even no. more complicated. Well, this is exciting. We don't often get chance to do this, Richard. Even you don't know about this. But we've got some news just in about the Jacobite steam train. Um, it has just flashed up on my screen that says, and ORR spokesman has said, quote, we have provided our findings to West Coast Railways on its application for an exemption, and we await its response. Close quote. Gosh. Now, make of that what you will. Well. Um, I'm tempted to have a bit of a speculator. <laughs> well, you're right. I mean, gosh, that is, a, that is breaking news. Um, uh, um, let me ask a question. Mm. Because I might have missed something, and you're pretty good on these official pontifications. We await its response. If they'd said yes, would they be awaiting its response? Well, that was my, that's kind of my off the cuff reaction as well, actually. If, if they'd been told it's fine, um, you've been, I mean, I suppose it's possible that they've said, we're going to grant you an exemption and we need your official mm -hmm. response. But you know what the answer is? Yeah. Unless it's an, uh, they've granted it subject to, um, and there are, they need to hear what the response is, or they've said no. <laughs> I mean, who, who knows? But that's really interesting. I think the, I think the fact that it says they await a response, I would, and this is pure speculation, <laughs> suggests is. that is more towards uh, edging the, towards the negative, not the positive. But listen, but look. Um, I must stress that's just me and Richard chewing yeah. that particular piece of fat out loud, having literally just seen it. That yeah. uh, um, the wonderful Steph fired that up onto my screen as you were talking about Branson and um, breaking I, news. There, I, you I know go. one thing for sure, Nigel. I think I know part of what we're going to be covering on next week's show. Oh yes, whichever <laughs> way the coin, whichever way the coin has landed. Oh, we'll be covering it. Um, all right. But uh, mm. probably moving on. Um, before we get to the uh, very important quiz, which does seem to generate actually arguably more controversy and comment than literally anything else <laughs> than we anything talk about. Else, I, I think it's great. It's really yeah, well, taken yeah, off. I know you it's love really it. taken off, Richard, since you started making mistakes. That's oh, thank you so much. You know, I was waiting for some comment, and you didn't. You didn't. Um, you didn't disappoint, right? Anyway. Before we get on to the quiz, uh, very important to thank some very generous viewers yes. on YouTube who uh, have left us um, super thanks. Um, John Kirkman. Thank you, John. Uh, Rob, who is the at Staffordian. I think this is Rob's third uh, third or fourth super thanks now. Um, Rob, it, honestly, we're, we're utterly um, oh, uh, just so appreciative. Thank you so much. I th you're a real super fan, so that's... Um, uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, Guy B, 3785. Um, so all, all of those uh, left a super thanks. And also Steve Bates um, left us ah. a super thanks. Yes, there is a bit of a story about Steve, I shall tell you. And it's um, a good one. I live um, uh, in a little village between Chippenham and Devizes. So 
um, on um, and the local post office is actually in the best ones in Devizes and it's in the middle of Sainsbury's. So uh, I was in Sainsbury's last week uh, with my daughter, Lucy, who's, uh, who's 13, and we were just wandering around and we're in the meat aisle, as you are. And um, this chap comes up and says, oh, hi, um, do you mind if I have a word? Uh, and um, he says, I oh, know you're Richard Bowker. I just wanted to tell you, I love Green Signals. And uh, he was... He's a driver for a um, very well-known uh, rail freight company uh, who are good good friends of ours. And we had a lovely chat about railway stuff and about uh, uh, and about uh, green signals. Um, and it was really, really nice. And as, but as we walked away, um, Lucy, who is, um, you know, she's kind of quite serious and, and thinks about things a lot without breaking step, step or even looking at me, just went, well, that was a bit random. <laughs> so... <laughs> Although I wasn't quite sure what to make of that. So thank you, Lucy. Um, but it was lovely. And um, I suppose that's the nice thing. We don't do this for uh, congratulations. We do it because, A, we love it. And we think that we're adding some value with Making a bit a of Making a contribution common, to the debate. Yeah, and some insight. And, yeah, okay, we challenge and we uh, we've had some fantastic guests on the let's face it, we're not daft we know it's the guests that that make an awful lot of what this show is but honestly when people say that they appreciate it that that means a lot so thanks steve and thanks everybody who left us a super thank and from steve's point of thanks, view well. you know if if i was walking through sainsbury's and so i oh i don't know mick fleetwood or whatever i won't wonder oh, and say that, excuse that. me are you are you <laughs> mick fleetwood you know but no but just to sort no. of break step and interrupt yeah. somebody's day and say are you yeah. richard baker takes quite better so it's really no, nice but he's it really nice shows how it, strongly look, they feel and we really yeah. appreciate it we do we do appreciate it uh, even yeah. though we are two old blokes blathering on about trains it's still um much appreciated thank you and a good bit of that story is just how monumentally unimpressed a 21st century teenager was with it all <laughs> <laughs> I bet she. I bet she didn't. I bet she made the most of telling the story to her mum and brothers when she got home. As she well. did. She did. <laughs> um, anyway, let's move on to the quiz itself. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it was a fairly straightforward one. It this was, week. but I, I didn't know the answer. Okay. Well, so the the um, the question was, where in the UK would I have seen um, both narrow gauge? Uh, and standard gauge wagons on the same train whilst that train was running in service. Oh, and by the way, I should say to the to the person on YouTube who said, "I don't think you could have seen it because you would be ninety years old." Uh, it was it was a rhetorical "Where would I have seen?" right rather than a literal one. But there you go. So, where in the UK would I have seen both narrow gauge and standard gauge wagons on the same train whilst it was running in service? The answer is the Leak and Manifold light railway which didn't actually go to leak which went um, to neither leak nor manifold did it i know it went through the manifold valley um but it actually went from a place called waterhouses where the standard gauge network ended um to hume end which is at the other end of the valley but the waterhouses um, and hume end railway doesn't have the same ring, it's not quite the same it? as leak no. and manifold is it no, no indeed it didn't survive very long um i think it closed in the 30s like it was the welsh a, island wasn't it in the linton and it and was Barnstable. actually yeah. similar things it was curious it was both an agricultural railway but also mainly a tourist thing there is actually um a very famous local landmark about halfway down it called thor's cave um which was very popular sort of in the sort of the 20s to go and visit um rather lovely it still survives not the railway but the track beds there um the alignments there they uh, the local authority bought it turned it into a footpath you can walk the entire length of it um and it's beautiful i mean so there's my um staffordshire moorlands um tourist board uh, advert on there i'm behalf. surprised but, that nobody suggested reopening it and rebuilding it I, uh, there's a bit of it has been turned into a road through the tunnel but anyway i'm sure somebody somewhere would love to say I, I don't think it would work but it's a lovely lovely thing hmm. um if you go onto youtube we can't show it i'm afraid because of copyright um, restrictions but if you type in leak and manifold light railway there's a, a little pathé newsreel from the thir early 30s called a quaint little railway i think it's called and you can actually see right at the beginning you can see the standard gauge wagon being put onto the oh, narrow gauge really? transport. onto a transporter. Yeah, it's actually, there is some black and white film of it, and I do recommend it. Oh, it's amazing. Blimey, I didn't it's know a, that. It's really good. See, yeah. I didn't know we'd had transporter wagons in there. They still, yep. I, I don't say they used, I think they demonstrate them yep. still on the German narrow gauge. Yeah. Yeah, there, there were a couple of people who pointed out some special events where it had been done, but our question was about in service, and I think that is the only place in service. Okay. 
Anyway, the winner was Cameron Murray from Buxton, which is kind of appropriate given that's that same part of the world, who entered by email. So congratulations, Cameron. If you email us on it again at info at greensignals.org, tell us where you would like your mug sent and we will get it on its way to you. And I guess we could, I mean, could we, is, yeah, sure, we could put a link on the website to that YouTube yeah, yeah. Oh, no, we absolutely can we put a that? link on it. Uh, we ju- what we just can't do is actually no, show should. the video because I think it's but, British Film Institute and they charge a lot of money. But let's put a link a to money, it but... so people can find it easily. Just click straight through to it. Good idea. Good idea. Um, this week's question, easy one, just to um, give everybody a bit of a break and hopefully um, uh, give, get Nigel off my back a bit. <laughs> so the, que- the question this week is, uh, where would I find the old, worse and worse? Um, So if you think you know where the old worse and worse is or what it is or who it is, I don't know, um, then email us info at greensignals.org or send us a comment on YouTube. Either works because we get a timestamp and we'll put all the correct answers into the pot next week, assuming there are any, and pick a winner. Oh, there will be. Even I know the answer to that one right now. Oh, it's that simple, is it? Oh, for a minute. Okay, there you go. (laughs) Damn, I didn't realise it was that easy, right? It okay. is. It right. is. So I predict a deluge of correct answers. A, a deluge. Mm. Okay. That's Can you word. quantify a deluge? Or even a, a tsunami. Okay. So quite a lot then. Yeah, I think so. Okay, right. I think so. So I want a really hard one thereafter, Richard, next week. All right. Okay. okay. Let us let us move on to brilliant news. We don't often get the chance to um, report a reopening. I think that, um, what was the last one? The last reopening? Uh, I'm not sure, actually. Was it, I think, I suppose, Ebervale reopened think, yeah. again after some work, but probably, would it would it be Oakhampton? I'm not sure. Um, oh, that's why I hesitated, because I think Ebervale did. Anyway, whatever. It's not yeah. often we get chance to... No, um, there's not many of them. So. ...to report a reopening. Um, and we can. The Leavenmouth branch in Scotland, in Fife, north of the Firth of Forth, um, has reopened on May 29th by the First Minister, John Swinney, marking the return of rail services for the first time in more than 50 years. So well done, Scotland, for showing the way again. Just a few factoids about it, which uh, caught my eye and quite interesting. 19 new single-track kilometres, two fully accessible stations at Cameron Bridge and in Leaven. And I don't want to strike a, a negative note, but... I, but you will. But I will. <laughs> um, the, the one beef I have with the Borders Railway, the stations are bloody ugly. Uh, they're very East German, um, and I hope they. I bet they're the same, but um, we don't seem to pay the same attention to station design with these days, do we? Despite them costing millions of pounds, Richard, a eh? um, over one kilometre of active travel bridges and routes connecting communities to the new stations are also in delivery as part of this integrated program of sustainable transport investment. The Leavenmouth Skills Academy enable nine young people to build their confidence in skills and permanent employment within the rail sector. So best wishes to them from Green Signals for a successful and safe career on the railway. Alongside the railway, work's also been undertaken to maximise the socio-economic benefits of the new rail link, with Scottish ministers committed to a fund of up to five million and five council offered to match fund this and lead on the delivery of the £10 million fund via the Leavenmouth Reconnected Programme. If you add that lot together, um, you can see that um, there is a a package of benefits across the board, as Oakhampton particularly had, which justified it. A Richard? Yeah, it's brilliant. I mean, do you remember when Bill Reeve was on the show? I do. um, He was talking about um, uh, this particular railway. uh, He talked about others as well, but this one in particular... And he was very passionate about uh, connecting communities, particularly for young people, access to educational opportunities and work opportunities. And social activities and all that. Yeah, and it was powerful stuff. And I I must admit, I hadn't really kind of considered it that specifically on this line. Um, But that's what's now going to be possible. So, no, look, I think this is is actually terrific. I have a question for you. Go on. Uh, But it might be a question for all our listeners, actually, to which uh, it's genuinely not a trick question. I I don't know the answer to this. Um, So you mentioned there that John Swinney, the first minister, opened it 
after a general election had been called. Oh, yes. Um, and I wonder, does that, does that, I mean, I, they're always so careful about this stuff. I can't believe that anybody um, missed this. So there must be a specific rule of which I'm not aware. But I thought once you got into PERDA, PERDA. arrangements, it became, you know, you couldn't do things that could be misconstrued as um as campaigning or give a political slant yeah yeah maybe because it was announced before the election that they were going to be doing this maybe perda well, only kicks in a number of weeks before the election I, d I don't genuinely don't know but i thought it was quite interesting because i don't think it being pre-arranged has much bearing on it because i know some network rail executives were booked to give speeches at various events in the next few weeks and had to cancel them yeah, and for, the same, for the same reason. So how they've, come... they've been booked for months. So how yeah. did how did yeah. Swinney? Because you know he didn't actually say vote for the um, the SNP because we re reopen railways, but that's what they're trying to avoid, isn't it? Even that impression yes. being given. Yeah, yeah. So well, if, if, any, know, if, you're, if anybody if you know, knows, yeah, yeah, let us know. Bill Reeve, if you're listening to this, do let us know. But well done, Scotland, for opening yeah, a, reopening great. a railway. We, you have the hearty thanks, salutes, and admiration of all at Green Signals. And sadly, that's all we've got time for this week. And you've had a bit of a bonus. You haven't had to listen to me and Richard talking quite so much because of the uh, the extent of the Hitachi package, which in all seriousness was a fantastic piece of work. And Steph and Richard did a brilliant job in conceiving, shooting, editing, and all the rest of it with that. It works a treat. So well done, you two. Um, to everyone out there, thanks for watching or listening. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up, leave a comment, and if you haven't already, please subscribe on YouTube if that's where you are. It really does help. And do join us again next week. Meanwhile, it's goodbye from me and... And it's goodbye from me. Thank you for being with us. See you next week. <laughs>